Hello and welcome to Mariology Without Apology. This is Dr. Mark Maravalli. My friends in Jesus and Mary, I'm very excited about today's program because we're going to talk about seven ways in which the church would richly and, and historically benefit from a new Marian dogma. Now, if you're unfamiliar with the doctrinal teachings of the church in terms of Our Lady as the co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces and advocate, I'd encourage you to look at some of the earlier uh, Mariology Without Apology uh, programs, as well as uh, some of the Mary Lives as, as well. Um, I, I want to go to the Second Vatican Council very briefly, just so we're sure that the doctrine of Marian co-redemption is uh, firmly uh, taught and founded in the Second Vatican Council. It, of course, was so before that with popes and saints and mystics, but particularly the papal magisterium, with Pius XI calling Our Lady the co-redemptrix on several occasions, going as early as 1885 with uh, Pope Leo XIII, uh, who proved a prayer of Our Lady as co-redemptrix. And then the three times co-redemptrix was used under the pontificate of Pius XII, Pope St. Pius XII, uh, and even the Holy Office inserting the title uh, in certain prayers and, and requests of approval uh, by the faithful throughout the world, uh, but leading up clearly to the teachings of the Second Vatican Council. And then, of course, following St. John Paul II, would call Our Lady the Corridentrix on seven different occasions and ubiquitously teach the doctrine of Marian co-redemption. But let's go to the Second Vatican Council, just so we're clear and have a firm foundation. Uh, Lumen Gentium number 57, this union of the mother with the son and the work of salvation is made manifest from the time of Christ's virginal conception up to his death. Uh, and then again, Lumen Gentium 58, the Blessed Virgin advanced in her pilgrimage of faith and faithfully persevered in her union with her son under the cross, where she stood in keeping with the divine plan, grieving exceedingly with her only begotten son, uniting herself with a maternal heart with his sacrifice, and lovingly consenting to the immolation of this victim, which was born of her. And several footnotes from previous papal statements support that Lumen Gentium uh, 58. And then again in Lumen Gentium 61, she conceived, brought forth, and nourished Christ. She presented him to the Father in the temple and was united with him by compassion as he died on the cross. In this singular way, she cooperated by her obedience, faith, hope, and burning charity in the work of the Savior in giving back supernatural lives to souls. So that's clearly objective redemption, right? Subjective redemption is the distribution of the graces, the releases. This is Mary's unique role with Jesus, new Eve with the new Adam in the obtaining of grace. As the council says, giving back supernatural lives to soul. Well, that, of course, presupposes that they are obtained, right? Therefore, she is a mother for us in the order of grace. And again, there's there's several beautiful references like Salvivi Dolores, number 25, by our, our great St. John Paul II, who talks about how Mary's suffering was mysteriously fruitful for the, for the redemption of all, and that her suffering was beyond imagination. Okay, so the doctrine is there. Again, we have it scripturally. Luke 1, 38, Mary's yes brings the Redeemer into the world. Luke 2, 35, the presentation where Simeon prophesies Mary's co-suffering at Calvary, and of course, John 19, 25 through 27, with the actual redemption of Jesus dying on Calvary, and as you heard Lumen Gentium say, and, and John Paul said many times, uh, in one dramatic way, he said Mary is, quote, spiritually crucified with her crucified son, but her role as co-redemptrix did not cease with the glorification of her son. That's his January 31st, 1985 Guayaquil uh, presentation, uh, his allocution on that. Okay, so let's go to seven reasons. Now, if you want more uh, uh, quotes and support and theological evidence for this, then go to ecematurtua.com. That's our Marological Journal, Ece Matertua, the International uh, Marological Journal for the International Marian Association, and look up the article, uh, Apologia Pro Dogma Sua, um, Reasons 
to benefit a solemn definition. Okay, apologia pro dogma sua, uh, right? In defense of the dogma, the cause for the dogma. All right, seven reasons. Number one is that a solemn papal definition would release great graces to the church. Now, this brings us back, my friends, to the beginning of this movement for a solemn definition. So we're going to 1915. Cardinal Mercier, prominent, renowned, a Belgian cardinal, who starts the campaign officially for a solemn definition of Our Lady's universal mediation, which is absolutely dependent on her co-redemption, uh, because it's World War I and he's seeking graces, graces for the world. And he writes several times that to acknowledge Our Lady's role, to grant her this on a solemn definition, on the highest level, will bring great graces to the church. Well, what's the justification for that theologically? It's called free will. And that God wants us to profess the truth freely. When we do, it's merit meritorious. It, it almost unlocks these uh, elements of grace that we so desperately need right now. Uh, and again, let's go to Scripture to understand Mercier's reasoning. Uh, go to Matthew 16, 15 through 20, the institution of the papacy. Jesus says, who do they say that I am? No identity crisis here on the part of our Lord. He wants to hear the truth from the people, from the Vox Populi, and in this case, from the future vicar of Christ. Simon says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. For that proclamation of truth, for that free consent, acknowledging who Jesus is, Jesus awards the church with the papacy and all the graces that would flow from the papacy. Why? Because Jesus honors, rewards, merits the proclamation of truth. So in this case, to solemnly proclaim that Our Lady is the spiritual mother of all peoples with these three key maternal manifestations of co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces, and advocate, to acknowledge that allows Our Lady to fully activate those roles. So what does that mean? Does that mean that uh, presently Our Lady is not interceding for anybody? Of course it doesn't mean that. It means for a full empowerment, if you will, to use the, 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 the much used term now, for a full activation, for the full operation of her role as mediatrix of all graces, we have to acknowledge it. We have to freely consent to it. So as all of humanity awaited the yes of a virgin, as St. Bernard of Clairvaux tells us, for us to get a redeemer, now heaven and earth waits for the yes of a man, the vicar of Christ, to solemnly acknowledge that Our Lady is, in fact, the spiritual mother of all peoples, so she can fully be fully uh, spiritual mother of all peoples for us today. It's a sound theological principle that God respects our freedom and sometimes only graces us in a full context when we consent to it. God will never force grace upon us. So this first category of historic graces through a solemn definition, uh, is not without uh, theological support, but also historical prefer, uh, precedence. We see, for example, at the time of 1849, the great crisis, almost sounds like a, a Hollywood script of crisis, because Pius IX is chased out of Rome. He's in exile at Gaeta, uh, and cardinals come to him and say, Holy Father, for you to return to Rome for us to get the papal states back, uh, proclaim the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Honor Our Lady that way, and she will honor us by restoring the papacy as it should be in Rome, in the Vatican, and also the graces that will come. Well, from exile in 1849, Pius IX wrote to all the bishops of the world expressing his desire to do this. He, of course, does it in 1854, the Holy Father is returned to Rome, to the Vatican, and 
the papal states uh, have a new, uh, the Holy Father is able to get uh, the, the heart of the papal states returned. And you then in 1870 have the declaration, the, the dogma of papal infallibility, which has a massive unifying effect for the church. I mean, at that time, my friends, the headlines in the Roman papers was, the Roman Empire fell, now the Catholic Church has fallen. They thought it was over, uh, but they don't understand the principle of Christ and the principle of grace and the intercession of Our Lady. So, number one is to receive great graces. I don't think we have to delineate how desperately we need great graces for the church and the world today. Okay, uh, number two, uh, to, to proclaim, and I want to re read a section of this to you, um, to proclaim a, a Marian dogma would, would complete the truth about Our Lady. Okay, what does that mean? As most of you know, we presently have four Marian dogmas. Mother of God, Immaculate Conception, Perpetual Virginity, Glorious Assumption. But note that none of those dogmas define or even essentially include Our Lady's relationship to you, to me, to humanity. And so a proclamation of Mary's relationship with humanity would complete Marian dogma. In fact, it's somewhat interesting that on December 1st, 1950, the major Mariologists of the world came together in Rome, had a symposium, unanimously came up with a votum or a petition for our Holy Father, at that time Pius XII, just one month after his definition of the Assumption, and asked him to solemnly proclaim Our Lady's universal mediation. Once again, based on her co-redemption. What was her justification? I mean, asking a Holy Father to do this just one month after he you know, proclaimed a dogma that doesn't happen so often. It was precisely this point, to complete Marian dogma, to establish Our Lady's relationship between uh, herself in heaven and humanity. The Mariologists gathered and said, look, there's the, the four dogmas establish all of Our, Our Lady's earthly prerogatives and, and her life on earth. But what about her continued role in heaven? That's why Lumen Gentium 62 would say, Taken up to heaven, she does not lay aside her saving office, but through her manifold intercession continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. Well, that's mediatrix of all graces, uh, because the gifts of eternal salvation are, in fact, our sanctifying grace. So, to complete... Marian dogma to define her relationship with humanity would obviously be a, a great richness. Now, some say, well, how can you say complete Marian dogma? We don't know what the future holds. Well, we also know that there's no more Marian doctrines to define. This would be it. Uh, so a second great benefit would be that completion. Third benefit for a solemn definition of Our Lady is co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces, and advocate. And again, Typically, as we speak about it in a category, the general category is Our Lady's spiritual motherhood. But essential to that category are her roles of co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. Why? Because every good mother suffers for her children, nourishes her children, and then intercedes for her children. Co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate. So, a solemn definition of Mary, including her role as co-redemptrix, would be an extraordinary grace for the world as a reminder, as a critical reminder right now, that suffering is redemptive, that suffering has a supernatural value. I happen to be taping this with great joy, uh, today's program, on the Feast of Padre Pio. I love Padre Pio. I know that you do too, but I gotta say I love Padre Pio. I mean, Padre Pio's big concern was whether he was stealing graces from other people because he took up every suffering he could. I don't know about you, but that was not my major concern uh, when I woke up this morning. Um, the love, the sacrifice, the humor, the great Marian devotion of Padre Pio. Padre Pio calls Our Lady the co-redemptrix, uh, mediatrix of all graces repeatedly. Suffering is redemptive. Suffering has a value. My friends... We can make a theological case for this, and that's, of course, 
you know, Colossians 1.24, that we are all called to make up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church. Our Lady does that uniquely. Our Lady uniquely participates in the acquisition of grace, as we talked about before, in what everyone since uh, Sheban onwards calls um, objective redemption, the acquisition of the graces. We all participate in the mysterious release of graces, people like Padre Pio, uh, in an extraordinary way. Uh, but only the new Adam and the new Eve participate in the attaining of the grace. So when we proclaim that our Lord was so grateful and that God the Father merited Our Lady, always a merit conditional, subordinate, completely dependent on the infinite, just merits of Jesus Christ, what we call de condigno merits. Still, those de congruo merits, at least, the, the, the merits that God the Father gives to Our Lady in the order of fittingness, appropriateness, because she's called by Him, by the Heavenly Father, to participate in the redemption as the new Eve. Whenever you respond to God's will in love, that's meritorious. So, of course, it was meritorious for Our Lady. And, of course, as St. John Paul II repeatedly says, it was a contribution for the redemption of us all in his Wednesday audience of uh, April 9, 1997, which is an extraordinary audience. I encourage you to look it up if you're a student or a, or a colleague in theology. Um, he makes very clear the rest of us participate in distribution of grace. Our Lady alone participates in the obtaining of the grace. So right now, as suffering exists, and quite frankly, my friends, I think suffering is going to increase. I don't think... Uh, we are uh, right around the corner from an era of peace, uh, depending on how you use that, that temporal metaphor, right? Uh, I think we're going to have more suffering. And the more suffering, the more we have to be reminded of its supernatural value. And nothing does that like Our Lady, the Co-Redemptrix, the Mother of Sorrows, who seven ways participates uniquely in the redemption of Jesus. All right, the fourth great benefit from a, a, a proclamation of this Marian dogma would be to reassert, to underscore the dignity of the human person and the necessity of human cooperation with the redemption. Again, we've done some Mary Live 2.0s on this. Uh, the necessity of humans freely consenting to grace, freely cooperating with the divine will. Uh, when you remove Mary as co-redemptrix, you're also removing the necessity of human cooperation in redemption. And you're removing <laughs> Trent uh, as well as Augustine, who says, God saves us without us, excuse me, God creates us without us, but he cannot save us without us. We have to humanly cooperate. So you see that in God's plan for Mary's role, he is at once confirming his, God's, appreciation for the dignity of the human person and freedom and how important we exercise freedom correctly and also the necessity to cooperate with grace. They're both contained in Mary's, yes, Mary's fiat. That's why the spiritual writers like De Cousade said, in Mary's, yes, is all the spirituality of all Christian spiritualities. It's all contained in that yes. And once again, as the Second Vatican Council repeats, even in Lumen Gentium 56, where it talks about Mary's the New Eve, that she actively, and it emphasizes actively, cooperated in the work of salvation, captured by Irenaeus' phrase of, of 185, it's staggering, in, in 185 AD, that Mary's the cause of salvation for herself and for the whole human race. Well, that's active human cooperation. And that underscores human dignity. It also underscores we do have to cooperate with grace for salvation. All right, number five, uh, we go to the dignity of woman. And I, I really, again, I want to underscore this. I'm going to read something to you uh, uh, regarding this as well. First little summary. It was not a pope or a bishop or a priest, or a deacon, or a man, but a woman who uniquely participates with the God-man 
in the greatest act of human history, that's redemption. Mary, the new Eve, is the complement, the feminine, creaturely complement to Jesus Christ, the new Adam. And it also, once again, in, in the topic we just talked about, about human dignity, human personhood, it is saying that God so honors a human person that he wants a human person involved in redemption. So let's make an important Christological distinction. Remember, Jesus is not a human person. Jesus has an entirely human nature, but Jesus is a divine person with a divine nature and a human nature. We don't want to fall into any type of Nestorianism. That means Mary is the example of a fully human person cooperating in the redemption, who then becomes the spiritual mother of all humanity. That's authentic feminine, uh, authentic Christian feminism in its greatest form. That's a true empowerment of woman in service to Jesus, not in opposition, not in a, a gender confusion, but a woman who understands how powerful it is to be the mother of Christ and to join him in the work of the redemption. Uh, let me read, there's a great quote by uh, Joseph Seifert. Uh, Joseph Seifert's a phenomenological uh, personalist uh, philosopher who, who did a very wonderful paper, uh, uh, a piece on uh, nine reasons for a solemn definition from a personalist perspective. Uh, Seifert says this, and I quote, this dogma would express a dignity of a woman's action which exceeds in activeness, sublimity, and effectiveness the deeds of all pure creatures and men, of all kings and politicians, thinkers, scientists, philosophers, artists, and craftsmen from the beginning of the world to the end of doom, and in a certain manner even of all priests except Christ. For all other priestly actions render only present Christ's redemptive grace and action, but Mary's act rendered our redemption itself possible, and thus mediated for mankind the most high gift of our divine Savior himself. Now, do you notice uh, Seifert's distinction there? Uh, he didn't call Mary a priest. He's saying that Mary participates in the obtaining of the grace that then all priests perform in, in, in their sublime way with the Eucharist and confession, all the sacraments, but that's all the release of grace. But Mary's role, in that sense, is above all priests, other than Jesus, the divine priest, because she participates with and under Jesus in obtaining the graces that are then distributed through sacred priesthood. So it's powerful um, and it's not hyperbolic. Everything uh, Joseph says, Seifert says in, in this uh, article is absolutely true about a woman's authentic dignity. Okay, number six, and you're going to balk at this one. Uh, it just happens to be true, so I'm going for it anyway. A solemn definition would serve authentic Catholic ecumenism. Now, once again, um, we just recently did a uh, Mary Life 2.0, uh, Mariagi Without Apology, on is it Mary or ecumenism? Do you have to choose one? Authentic ecumenism makes very clear. And again, go back to the Second Vatican Council. Sometimes, you know, these terms, a term like ecumenism almost sounds like the term love in the 70s. Love can mean anything. Um, and so you've got to define your terms. If you go back to Unitatis Redintegratio, numbers 4 and number 11, it, it very profoundly teaches, first of all, that the first responsibility of, of, of Catholic ecumenism is to tend to the Catholic household through conversion and integrity of teaching. Okay. So that means the first thing we do to be truly Catholic ecumenists is to be truly Catholic, to live it dynamically. So it can also have an appeal for those who are not Catholic. Secondly, read into Grazio uh, says in number 11 that there's nothing more foreign to authentic ecumenism than a false arenicism, that is, arenicism means a false peace, 
based on a compromise of doctrine. That's a powerful statement. You're basically saying you can't compromise doctrine for a pseudo ecumenism John Paul II in Ut Unum Sint in 1994 will call it just that. That is, it's a pseudo ecumenism uh, Let me read what, what John Paul says uh, as well as a confirmation because it's so good. Uh, he says, mm -hmm. yeah, with regard to the study of areas of disagreement, the council requires that the whole body of doctrine be clearly presented. Full communion, of course, will have to come about through the acceptance of the whole truth into which the Holy Spirit guides Christ's disciples. Hence, all forms of reductionism or facile agreement must be absolutely avoided. Unity will by God can be attained only by the adherence of all to the content of revealed faith in its entirety. In matters of faith, compromise is a contradiction with God, who is truth. In the body of Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, who could consider legitimate a reconciliation brought about at the expense of truth? Okay, those are both from Ut Unum Sint, number 36. So why would a dogma actually help authentic ecumenism? Because it would clearly articulate on the highest level of truth that the Catholic Church does not consider Mary A. a goddess, which really has no tradition. It, you, you won't be able to find any recognized uh, bishop or, 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 or certainly no pope, no, no major teacher who ever claimed that Mary was a goddess in any, identifying them in any real context as a Catholic. Uh, but also what Mary does in redemption, what she does not do. Um, again, I'm going to read you Cardinal O'Connor's, the late Cardinal O'Connor, great champion of the church in America for many years. In his letter for this definition, he says, quote, Clearly, a formal definition, a formal papal definition, would be articulated in such precise terminology that other Christians would lose their anxiety that we do not distinguish adequately between Mary's unique association with Christ and the redemptive power exercised by Christ alone. Okay, so you go to an authentic ecumenical dialogue, and that means, as John Paul instructs, and, and so does the Council, you have to present the fullness of doctrine. And so you present the Church's teaching regarding Our Lady as co-redemptrix mediatrix of all graces. Uh, the objection is that, well, you know, you consider Mary to be a goddess, and then you hand them a papal bull, a proclamation on the highest level of truth, saying, no, we don't. We never have. But just to be sure, here, this is what our Holy Father has just solemnly proclaimed. That's our highest level of truth, that Mary is not a god, and that Mary only participates in the great and unique redemptive accomplishment of Jesus Christ, the only divine redeemer. Mary participates. Now, if you're concerned about true ecumenical activity, that's going to be a great benefit. The other option is blow off the doctrine. Don't tell them what we believe. Well, then that's pseudo-ecumenism. Then that's false arenicism. Then you shouldn't be doing ecumenical dialogue in the name of the church because it's not honest. And quite frankly, we have to be careful of a, a subtle egoism which says we can accept the full truth, but they never will. My Protestant brother said, we'll never accept the real truth, so I'm not going to offer to them. It's just going to upset them. Uh, that's disauthentic and, and, uh, and disingenuous on, on many fronts. So a solemn proclamation of exactly what we hold about Our Lady's role in the redemption will help authentic ecumenism in a major way. And once again, it brings the dialogue to the table. And that's what both Ut Unum Sint says and also Unitatis Redintegratio from the Council. We have to bring up what is distinctive about the Catholic Church if we're going to have a true and a respectful dialogue. All right, seventh reason why uh, it is of great benefit to proclaim a fifth Marian dogma. And notice this is coming at the end. And that is a confirmation from 
authentic private revelation that heaven wants this and heaven wants it now. Now, many commentators on Fatima, the late John Hafford, who found, founded the World Apostle of Fatima, Ambassador Howard D., the Marian a champion of the Philippines, uh, Dr. Courtney Bartholomew from Trinidad, uh, one of the foremost aid research, AIDS researcher, but also uh, a prolific author on Our Lady. All the major commentators have said that when Our Lady appears at Fatima on October 13th, she appears as Our Lady of Sorrows with Jesus. The whole Fatima message is a message of Marian co-redemption. And that because of that, and with later apparitions getting more explicit about this, that the proclamation of the fifth dogma, the dogma of Our Lady as spiritual mother of all peoples with these three roles, is the key to the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary revealed at Fatima. Now, there have been uh, several apparitions uh, which have been approved. Uh, for example, Akita, Japan, and Akita is in its message, uh, according to uh, the bishop uh, and also commentators, uh, it is the continuation of what takes place at Amsterdam. Now, uh, what's going on in Amsterdam? Well, on December 30th uh, of, of last year, 2020, the local bishop said that even though the Amsterdam apparitions had been approved as constante supernatural etate, that at this point, uh, the status of Amsterdam has now been reduced to non consta de supernatural etate, back to the 1974 statement on Amsterdam, which is very clearly not consta de non, not that it's not authentic, uh, not that it's condemned or prohibited, but that is, it is, um, its authenticity is not confirmed. Non consta de supernatural etate is the middle category. And so because of that, uh, there can be no references to the messages of the Lady of All Nations from Amsterdam, but the image, the prayer, and other forms of general devotion uh, are allowed to continue. Now, I mention all that because in those messages of Amsterdam, there are well over a dozen very clear and strong messages, uh, references that the dogma of Mary's co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces and advocate would bring forth the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, that it would bring historic graces to the, to the church and the world, and in fact, that it would bring peace, true peace to the world. Well, now those messages are, for the time being, uh, not to be used to spread devotion, and so we absolutely respect that. Uh, I'm talking about uh, theological uh, content of messages, uh, to a theological audience uh, with the clear distinction that we should obey uh, in full at this time what is coming forward uh, from uh, the, the, the new Bishop of Amsterdam, even though it is a reversal, which has uh, interesting uh, canonical questions about whether um, a new Bishop can totally reverse a declaration of authenticity from a form. At any rate, obedience, 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 especially on this piece of, of, of Padre Pio, right? So, but you can't understand Akita, what happens in Japan, uh, without some context to Amsterdam, because it's the image of the Lady of All Nations in Japan that will weep 101 times. The spiritual director, Father Thomas Aquinas Yashuda, will say that the, Amster the uh, Akita message is the message of Mary Corredemptrix, and the bishop who approved Akita in Japan in 1984 said that the message uh, of Akita is a continuation of Amsterdam. So, with due respect uh, and obedience to both bishops here, um, Akita is an approved apparition that is uh, seen as a continuation of Amsterdam, and therefore, certainly the doctrine of co-redemptrix, um, as well as an appreciation, which of course one can have outside of any private revelation, an appreciation for Cardinal, what Cardinal Mercier did back in 1915, to start a movement, to solemnly define Our Lady's universal mediation, based on her co-redemption, to bring great graces to the Church and the world. So, I believe that absolutely to be true, that this proclamation will bring historic graces to the church and the world, arguably in a time when it may need it more than ever. 
So once again, if you want uh, full references, go to Ece Mater Tua, E-C-C-E-M-A-T-E-R-T-U-A.com. Um, and it is uh, in the in, in the, the 2020, uh, you can you can look it up with the with the archived issues. Uh, or just punch it in the search, um, the uh, Apologia Pro Dogma Sua, which is as a nutshell, those are the theological benefits, uh, the theological rationale for really what would be, I believe, supernatural benefits to the proclamation of a fifth Marian dogma. I pray um, that you see so as well. If not, we can certainly discuss and dialogue uh, about the appropriateness of this definition for those who do understand it, I encourage you to pray. I encourage you to pray the prayer that comes from Amsterdam, the prayer of the Lady of All Nations, which was explicitly approved by the December uh, 30th, 2020 um, uh, statement by the new bishop. Um, again, the prayer can be used originally in the messages. Uh, we say the alleged messages now, right? Um, the prayer was given to prepare the world for the proclamation of the dogma. Well, we don't have to quote the messages for that. We can pray the prayer because we think it's a beautiful prayer and it's a fruitful prayer. I personally believe that the prayer has a special efficacy for the fifth Marian dogma. So let's end by praying the prayer of the Lady of All Nations. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, send now your Spirit over the earth. Let the Holy Spirit live in the hearts of all nations, that they may be preserved from degeneration, disasters, and war. May the Lady of all nations, the Blessed Virgin Mary, be our advocate. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. Thanks for joining us for Mariology Without Apology. This is Dr. Mark Mirvalli saying God bless you all.